Welcome to The Realtor Lady. I'm Michelle Replogel. This is Michelle Replogel, and you are with The Realtor Lady. And today I am talking with Allison Hooker. She is a realtor from San Francisco and a comedian. And we are going to be talking about the differences in the San Francisco real estate market and, the, and how it kind of even relates or its opposite to the Santa Cruz real estate market. <laughs> Welcome. Tell me all about you. Yeah, my name is Allison Hooker. Um, I am a local comedian and a real estate agent, which is a funny mix because I realized one day how egocentric both of those things are. <laughs> um, and so I had to do some self-reflecting there. Uh, no, I'm kidding. But um, yeah, I work in, in San Francisco. I actually work the greater Bay Area. My I partnered up, I've been a realtor for five years and I'm partnered up with a woman who's been in real estate for 34 years. So we actually do the greater Bay Area, not just San Francisco, because um, I actually sell a lot in the East Bay and Oakland because that's where people can afford it a bit more, you know? Yeah. Um, and yes, I, I love them both. I love real estate. I love comedy. They're both both very related to um tapping into people and what, you know, it's really, it's more about people than this paperwork for sure. So I am all about funny stuff only because I think that when I'm with people all day um, and I've, I'm, I'm going in my 17th year, so I'm kind of getting a little bit better at managing a lot of the people energy that comes along with this business. Right. It's a people business. It's not a house business. And you got to love them at their worst. You do and, and you understand. I mean, there, you know, I had a, a transaction just recently where the seller was there and the buyers were really upset and I got a nasty email. They wanted to go by themselves. So the neighbor was kind of facilitating the visit and the seller was there. And I had to explain to them that that's his parents' house. And, you know, yeah. he's, he's kind of communicating to you that he's losing something and, you know, it just turned them completely around. They are so much nicer to me now. They're so much nicer to him. They uh -huh. needed that little person tweak of how this is people and not, you know, emotions and yeah, um, really. is not the deal. Um, but uh, who are, okay, so you were kind of in the East Bay. Do you see any transplants coming up there or people moving out of the area? What, what do you see in terms of... Um, so I'm based in San Francisco, um, but I mean, I work the East Bay as well. And I don't know, in San Francisco, there has been a, a bit of an exodus, but it's kind of people that weren't that into San Francisco to begin with. Um, I'm a local, I grew up here, so I definitely have seen a lot of changes in the city. And um, I actually lived down in Santa Cruz for quite some time too. Oh, wow. But I've, um, I, I don't know, a lot of people are saying like, isn't it great or housing price is gonna drop? And no, they're not really dropping. Like maybe some high rise in Soma, the prices have come down on a condo there. But in general, there's just a line of people waiting for the opportunity to buy something in San Francisco. So the people moving out is, is totally fine with me. <laughs> they weren't in love with the city anyways. They wanted to live on Sixth and Market right near work so they could walk to work, but then complained about the issues that San Francisco has instead of, trying to be part of the city and fix them. So oh I'm okay with the shift. Can, okay with the shift. We can just change places. We can <laughs> only change places. Well, I guess we're sending them all to you, huh? Well, I mean, they're coming down here. Oh, but um, I have to tell you, people that come from San Francisco are a delight though, because mm -hmm. they get the homeless problem. Mm -hmm. They get that you have to lock your car or they will take everything out of your car or take everything out and leave it unlocked, whatever, however you want to do it. But those universal things that you have to deal with in a city, San Francisco people get it. So it's always, it's lovely because I don't have to go through the whole song and dance. It, you know, so I mean, especially these cities though, it is absurd. You, I mean, you can leave nothing in your car and they'll smash your windows anyways. So why? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My dad used to just, he, I mean, here in town, he used to just take everything out and leave the windows rolled down. <laughs> well, then someone will sleep in it up here. So yeah, you don't know. <laughs> We have our times like right now. I mean, it's not that crazy, but yeah, everybody's been stealing stuff out of cars for here since I was very young. 
Um, but you say, so you're saying the people who are moving out are people who weren't, so they're not natives. They're not people that really were in love with the city anyway. It feels that way to me. Like in general, people who are leaving San Francisco, they're leaving because they think, oh, now I can work remotely. I can work from home. Why would I live in San Francisco? Which to me, I'm like, there's a million reasons I want to live in San Francisco that have nothing to do with walking to work. You know, <laughs> yeah. like I pay the premium for a reason. And is that climate, arts, uh, dining? I mean, what, what, San Francisco? Yeah, pretty much all open. of those things. Um, I lived in Santa Cruz for quite some time and I love the fact that it's um, outdoorsy. I rode my bike everywhere. I lived on the east side and I would, you know, do the, my bike ride all the way from west side to east side every day. And I love everything about the outdoorsiness of Santa Cruz. But um, I, I like, I appreciate that there's more than um, just like surfer bro culture in San Francisco. I needed a little bit more than like, did back in, how are the waves, you know? <laughs> so yeah, restaurants, just a lot of what Santa Cruz has, the outdoors, you can go, you know, running in somewhere beautiful, but then you still have a, a whole city life. I mean, San Francisco is an incredible place. Yeah. You don't have winter. Yeah, we we shut down. I mean, we pretty much. I mean, there's bars and stuff, but this is a pretty sleepy town at night. And I we stayed in San Francisco a couple of years ago, and I think we stayed out till like one o'clock in the morning. And I think other people were just getting started, and we were like, "Oh, I think it's time to go to bed now." <laughs> Must be European. Really fun. That was really fun. Yeah. Yeah, we're pretty sleepy here. I don't know if I'm part of the surfer bro, but I definitely grew up with it. <laughs> you do know what I mean though. Oh, it's, yeah. it's totally. exhausting. And I'm a surfer. I used to be a surf instructor, but it is exhausting that that culture. Yeah. Well, I think part of San uh, I mean Santa Cruz's culture too is just kind of this that sometimes there's a little inclusive exclusive stuff going on that gets a little mm -hmm. even as we're up there. Um how about in the in, in the pandemic now are things a uh, bit, bit open outdoors? How are things going? It's, it's pretty busy. I'm down in the uh, Capitola area right now. That's where the studio is. And this place has just been hopping the whole time. I mean, it just barely seemed to slow down, but it's super busy now. It's all outdoors right now. Like there's a little tiny bit of eating indoors. It's just starting to open up, mm -hmm. but it, it's, mm -hmm. it's busy. Um, everything just kind of seems to be just kind of ramping up each day without the government saying anything it just people just seem to like more cars on the road more people everywhere just totally. is that the same yeah the same I mean I'm doing comedy shows to parklets of people <laughs> so there's like I'm, I'm telling jokes to parking meters and then a group of four people and then you know a couple of feet between them and another parking meter and it's I mean we're outside in the cold I have to wear a face shield while I'm on stage. Um, oh my gosh. Inside noise is limited. So at one of our comedy shows, they've taken away the microphone. So I'm just in the street looking like a, I don't know, kind of like a crazy person, just yelling at people. But audiences are just so excited to be out doing something that they're laughing and having a good time. So that's been, it's been nice, but it's not something I, I it's just crazy what we've gotten used to. <laughs> like it used to be clubs of hundreds of people. And now I'm like, can I please tell a joke to a parking meter? <laughs> uh, what do you this little off of real estate? What do you joke about? What what's your kind of um area of comedy? Yeah, I don't know. Um probably a lot of self-deprecation. <laughs> um I guess I I grew up with a, an older sister that um, I was always trying to cheer up by teasing myself, by being the butt of the joke. So I think that that kind of carried over. Um, I don't really joke about real estate. I try to bring it up in my set because I have gotten clients that way, matter of fact. Nice. Yeah, totally. So I, I make small jokes like, you know, I'm, I'm actually a real estate agent. I just do comedy for the money. Um, or I'll, <laughs> or I'll figure out who's got, who asking people what they do for a living and figure out who has a lot of money and then tell them I'm a real estate agent, you know? Um, and that's worked. I, I had one girl contact me. She found me on the internet and said that she had seen me do comedy a year earlier. And she turned to her husband and she's like, she's just so honest and raw. We can trust her. <laughs> right. I found funny because I was thinking about like, what kind of material was I doing a year ago at Cobb's Comedy Club? And I was like, it's pretty, it was pretty dirty, honestly. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> I like, oh, yeah, I guess I am being honest, huh? <laughs> but um, yeah, I also had someone meet me once at, at a comedy show and he told me he wanted to go see property. 
And, you know, it's a late night bar show that I met him at and we're talking and I give him my card and then I take him on tour. And as I'm driving him on tour, he's like, wow, you're, you're really professional as a realtor. Oh, <laughs> I, like, I, don't you expected. <laughs> I don't know what he expected. Maybe I was going to be cracking jokes about each room in the house. You know, I was like, yeah, it's a little bit different than comedy. <laughs> I do use it as, you know, a way to kind of bring down the stress for people though. I'll make a lot of jokes inside the house or, you know, kind of just try to bring a little humor to the whole. Absolutely. They're looking at this house and they like it, but we also understand there's like, you know, the line out the door yeah. or the, the agent already has two offers in hand and we decide to go see it without a, a hope and a prayer. Just I know. Do you, is it also in Santa Cruz that things are priced at nine, nine, nine when they're going to go for a million too? It's in not auction style per se. It's, but there's a couple different things going on. There are agents out there that are really old school and they are pricing for where they think the market should be. Uh -huh. <laughs> I actually talked to an agent. He priced it because he, he wanted it there. He wanted it to sell there because he, he said that was affordable. That same house sold for 200,000 over. Yeah, see, in San Francisco, the technique has become a way that is actually really awful for, for everyone involved, I think, for buyers and sellers. But what it, what it is is that if you don't um, price it under, people will look right past it because you'll go on a tour and you'll look at something for 850 and you walk in the next one and it's also listed at 850, but the second one is going to actually go for a million one. And, but then of course you forget about the one that's going to go for what it's priced at. So no one is looking at the one that's actually accurately priced. Everyone forgets about it because it's not the nicest gem of the tour that you saw. And then there's that, I mean, it's just this expectation of overbids and it's tough because buyers are always trying to ask me, well, what, what is the overbid? It's going to go like 20% over. And I'm like, it's random. It's not a percentage. 999 is like a classic San Francisco, 995, 998, 999 is a classic listing price. That just means we're just trying to have a bidding war. It's going to go well over a million and it could be a million two. It could be a million four. We don't know. <laughs> That's so hard. Yeah. It's, it's, it's definitely like this here. And we bid, we were, ironically, I've done two bids for a buyer. We had one was nine, one was 10 offers that we were competing against. Mm -hmm. Then we went up for one that we were only competing against another offer. And the other offer came in really high. And then they said, well, we didn't come in high enough to start. I was like, well, you're going to counter offers. Why would we play? I was yeah. like, that just, it just made no sense to me. And honestly, at the end of the day, I think they really wanted a couple and they didn't want a single person because I think they thought she'd back out. Uh, that's too bad. Yeah. So there's, there's stuff that goes on. The other part of it is um, I'm hyper aware of discrimination. That's just really seems really prevalent in this type of market where I feel like people are getting kind of set aside for something, something about them will get them set aside. Oh, interesting. I haven't noticed that. Um, it's just the more cash in the deal speaks harder in San Francisco. Is there a lot of cash? There's a lot of all cash offers for sure. And then if it, if there's a loan um, and a lot of people will get inspections done before they go on the market. So they're expecting a non-contingent offer. Right. All contingencies wave, you know, uh, but uh when there's a loan, I have the lender call the listing agent and say that this is going to go through for sure because that there, I mean, loans have been a little swirly lately. I, I had a, I had a TIC, which is always more difficult on the lending side, but it took two months longer than expected for the loan to go through. And they were well qualified. They could have qualified for almost twice as much money as they were trying to borrow, but it's still just banks are kind of in this COVID moment, a little, yeah. a little funny. Well, yeah. And I had an appraisal issue. I'm going to do a, a little quick podcast after this about this crazy appraisal spiral we're in too. Yeah. That is a really insane spot to be in. Like I have a loan pretty much done. Everything's done, but we couldn't get an appraiser to pick up the, couldn't get them to pick up the actual order because it was a hard property. So they just don't take it because they get paid the same to do. 
Wow. That's so frustrating. Yeah, it's it's crazy. And it's really hard to get everybody's head wrapped around it. Yeah, I, I actually bought a place for myself um, just in November. I uh, bought a condo in Dolores Heights in San Francisco. And um, I my lender was able to do an appraisal waiver. And I was just happy, not because I didn't think it would appraise, but just because I didn't want to have to wait that time period. I wasn't sure how that was going to go. Yeah, there's there's some of those out there. Um, what is it like in the East Bay compared to San Francisco when you're helping buyers or sellers? Um, it's just compared to San Francisco, more affordable. Uh, there's a couple differences in um What's more affordable? Because I'm hoping that I'll get a little bit uh, more broader audience on this. So what's more affordable? Yeah, good question. So Oakland is a bit of a checkerboard. There's a lot of areas, you know, that have been nice for a long time. And there's a lot of areas that are still pretty rough. Um, but you can get, a, for a million dollars in Oakland, you can actually get a single family home in a nice neighborhood where you have a backyard and it's a nice, beautiful 19, early 1900s um, in good condition, single family home with a yard and everything for a million. Um, you could get, you could also probably, I would say high eights, you could get a home in a neighborhood that um, is walkable and, and has decent schools and things like that. What about um, bidding wars for those homes? What's that? What about bidding wars? wars for those homes ever yeah still there's bidding wars not so much well yeah there's still a lot of people offering I try to avoid having that anxiety around it that it's going to be a bidding war and not like hype it that way and it's just like let's do our highest and best and if we get it we get it type of re relax a little on on that hype of it all because it's not really like you're going to be we don't do multiple counters very often. Um, oh, so there. it's highest and best right out of the gate? It's really usually highest and best right out of the gate. Yeah. Sometimes they'll multiple counter on like the two best ones, but usually, you know, you're having conversations with the agent and getting a feel for what they, what they think they're seeing coming in. And we, we all try to do highest and best right away because we don't want to offend the buyers and make them go away. And I don't know. Well, you know, I, I, I kind of like that idea. I, we had a, a sale here in town where an agent countered 23 offers. What, and all of those were out? All those counters? Yes, they were. That's insane. He, now, I actually gave him a hard time. I had another broker told me that you should counter every single one. And I, I said, no, you need to let that buyer go that wasn't in like the top three, top five and get sweet. moving. And then just let those poor people go because, you know, a lot of those people, I kind of ran into those agents and was talking to them. And a lot of those people had hope. I'm like, <laughs> Exactly. And that creates so much anxiety for everybody, actually, because for the buyers, especially when they are trying to figure out how high uh, it's, it's so hard, you know, and what is their highest that they can go? And, you know, I mean, you always go, it feels like people always go into a transaction planning to spend one amount. And if they are able to, they will always spend more. You know what I mean? Yeah. You always want something more than what you can afford. For some reason, right outside, if you want, if you qualify for 700,000, you're going to want 750. If you qualify for a million, you're going to want a million one. It's just like, <laughs> kind of how it goes. Well, that's but Tell me how people do that and you did it yourself. Tell me about that. You were telling me about how people start their search. Well, yeah, that was a funny thing because I, I saw this moment in San Francisco where um, I was showing condos. Like it was, it was condos, but not in high rises because the buyers I was working with weren't interested in those and, and neither am I. Uh, you know, elevators and hallways and big buildings downtown is not really my style. I ended up buying... Um, a condo in a six unit building that used to be a TIC and is now condo converted. Um, and I like that smaller building, smaller HOA, all of that is just more my style. But um, I was showing property to these clients and I was noticing that every property we saw, the listing agent would call me and see if I was bringing an offer. And I thought like, whoa, what's happening in San Francisco that, that listing agents are calling me and they were really saying like, hey, I have a very motivated seller, bring any offer. And I was like, there has been a shift. And, and I owned a, a condo in Oakland at the time. So what I did was I 
started to look for myself in San Francisco and I thought I would take my time and I thought that it would take a while. First tour that I took myself on, I found the place that I wanted to buy and I really, really wanted it. But same with the first tour, I started right away knowing my price point was around um, like high nines, maybe maybe up to a million. And I started right away pulling property that was listed at a million too and going and looking at which is exactly what I tell my buyers not to do. No, we're not going to look at property out of your price point. We're going to try to look at it in your price point, which is kind of hard to do in San Francisco where everything is oddly priced, but we're going to try to stay in your price point because you're going to fall in love with something you can't afford. <laughs> so it's like funny to catch myself doing that. Like, oh, and I'll go look at this one. It's a million too. You can't, I can't buy a million too. I can't afford it. <laughs> so can, would you mind sharing what you bought and kind of around about how much it was? Yeah, I mean, it's public record. <laughs> yeah, I bought a two bedroom condo um, in, it's two uh, buildings up from Dolores Park on the Castro side. So it's, it's, I've got a view, I can see sort of downtown San Francisco behind me and I'm right up from Dolores Park and I bought it for 860. And with there um, multiple bids on it? You know what, for whatever reason there were not, but I really feel like I got an amazing, um, an amazing moment on this one because we're back now I'm showing property again and it's back to listing agents don't bother to call you after you view property and it's it's back to being competitive and things are coming on and off very quickly so I'll um I'll share with you um I go to I used to go to some seminars of some uh, coaches that were coaching San Francisco agents and then kind of all Bay Area agents and a lot of the San Francisco agents had such attitude. They just thought they just have this market where they can just put anything on. Like they're just so great. And, you know, I started getting all these emails about how reduced and uh -huh. from San Francisco agents about how, you know, like they kind of seem desperate. And I was like, I am here for this. I want to watch this. Uh -huh. guys have just been kind of rubbing it in our face that they can put anything on the market and get multiple offers. And one guy was like doing a hundred million a year and uh, he was much. nice enough, but the rest of them were so snotty. And I was like, Oh, I'm just going to, I I even recognized some of the emails that came through. I was like, Oh, I, I like this. I'll just, I'll just about <laughs> well, I understand exactly what you mean. Um, my business partner and I, her name is Heidi Mueller. And we are not that way at all. We're very, um, you know, what don't want to create the anxiety of bidding wars or the pressure of, uh, I've been with a client before, before COVID, when we were just able to go in and out of property on the weekend with your lockbox and you didn't have to have an appointment necessarily, you know, if you were going when it wasn't an open house. I've had agents before tell me to stand outside and wait because their client wasn't done looking. I'm like, I think it's okay if we're, if we're walking in the same property at the same time, like they don't own it yet. Like they're <laughs> so sorry. Your clients are not that special. Like I'm supposed to sit in the driveway with my client because, Oh, your, your high end clients are not done viewing the property. Like <laughs> not their property. Tell them to buy it. <laughs> well, we do wait outside, but um, yeah, there, there's pre -COVID? yeah. Pre COVID uh -huh. gets away. It's, even sometimes we um, make each other put the key back in the lockbox and make them take it out. So, you know, if I don't know an agent, I'll make yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, that's, I think last year I, I kind of doubled down and actually called more agents and just talked with them. Cause I was like, I wasn't seeing them anywhere. So I really got a little, Oh, I miss talking to, you know, I miss talking to other realtors, especially when it was such a weird market last summer. Yeah. Um, so, so it's getting busy. Who's moving in? We kind of, I would say people oh. that have just been waiting to be able to buy like myself. I, you know, just people who have been wanting to buy in San Francisco, there's sort of always a line of people wanting to do that. So you're not really seeing people come from other areas. Mm. No, I mean, always there's people coming in but no i i'd say that a lot of people that i that i'm working with a lot of buyers are people who have lived here for a while so that's now an opportunity for them that's kind of cool yeah and the cash where are they getting this cash is that a lot of the cash i see is from parents i was gonna say you know that's a conversation i have with people a lot that are 
it's so funny how many people really, really, even if they have willing parents that are willing to give them money or help them out, they really want to do it on their own. And you go down that path for a little while. And then sometimes you have that conversation, like maybe, maybe your parents want to help you. And then they come back and they're able to put 20% down, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, Totally. Lots of parent help, uh, especially for people who grew up in the area and their parents find themselves in a high equity situation and they realize that their next generation has been totally priced out of the Bay Area um, or just crazy amounts of tech money. I mean, there's people making so much money in this town. It's ridiculous. Wow. I, I'm exactly what for me, I just see the the cryptocurrencies and tech is so just feels like it could crash down, but it's not. <laughs> it's yeah, whatever, it's isn't it? a bubble still bubbling. I don't know. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that was interesting. I've been following it a little bit too. Is that the post office actually kind of weighed in on how many people are leaving California? And they're like, yeah, it's not what you think. They're moving around, but the actual amount of people actually moving out of California is not what you think. And I thought that was kind of interesting. Movie companies are like, oh, they're moving. And the post office is like, hmm, not uh, so much. So they can afford movers. <laughs> they can. Afford. So um, there's a couple companies that have actually closed some of their, their buildings down and the people are working from home. So you're not seeing tons of people leaving, really. You're, they're just still at home, still waiting to buy. I mean, I think San Francisco gets a lot of press about how much it's all changing and yeah, I mean, it's, that's a hard thing to read, especially when stuff is not totally open. But the few things that are going on, people are excited to be out where they can. And um, we're not seeing things sit on the market. That There was a moment there last year where um, agents were calling and things were sitting on the market. But no, it seems that things are coming on and off in six days again. Wow. So it's yeah. just ramping up. I mean, we're just it's middle like of March here. So it's probably just getting ready to go yeah feels that way let's see what else do I think about San Francisco and Santa Cruz we still have some offers that can be contingent so not on the sale of another home you mean just with a loan or no sometimes you can sell another home I'm in a transaction where my buyers are buying a home and the the, the people are buying their next home um, but yeah. Yeah, last summer in the middle of it super busy I, I managed to squeeze it out. So we still have a little bit left of some kind of normal, well, normal, there's no normal anymore. Uh, what used to be that you can have a contingency maybe for your appraisal, for your loan, but that, that, that's still really hard on the really cute property down in by the beach. You can't, you need to have lots of cash. It really just depends on the area. Yeah. Cause you have tons of people now moving in to Santa Cruz and Aptos that are commuting to the Silicon Valley, right? They might eventually. Some of them, um, some of the bigger companies, depending on what you do, have just said, you don't need to come back. Right. Um, but Google is filling in with other stuff. So for all those people that may be allowed to work from home from now on, we'll just be filled in with other stuff. They're, they're, they're doing data centers, they're doing other stuff. So those buildings and people work for them or deal with them, that's not going away. I think there was a lot of doom and gloom, like, oh, it's just all gonna go away somehow, but. <laughs> yeah, we're pretty resilient in this area to, Resil I don't know, an economic crash, I think. Yeah, we still have these really nice places to live that a lot of people want to live in. Right. So what what interesting times have you had with buyers or sellers you can tell us about? Have you were you able to conjure up any? Um let's see, I had a that very impossible uh TIC sale. Uh Common. you have TICs in Santa Cruz, many of them. We have like four that I'm aware of. Oh, that's what I wanted to ask you. So um, TIC is tenant in common. You said yours was a tenant in common, TIC, and it 
went to condo. Is that something you're seeing? Because then you can actually get loans easier on them, right? Uh, no, and it's better ownership, better resale price. Um, no, the condo conversion wait list in San Francisco is 20 years long. <laughs> What is it? What is a condo conversion? Tell tell me about that. It just means that the city accepts that you're going from being a TIC to a condominium and then it changes over and the value of the property goes up because it's better ownership. Why 20 years? What's up? What's I don't know. You know, I I assume it has something to do with um wanting to limit people's ability because you could just create a TIC, say I owned a I owned a property that was a single family home and I split it into two units and we, we bought it together and we could just create a TIC agreement between the two of us. Right. And so you can't just do that to buy a, a single family home and chop it up into six pieces. And maybe that's why they don't want to make it easy to condo convert because you change land use, but I am, I'm not really sure why, why can't we just have more condos? And no TICs. You just happened to grab yours right when it was converted or? No, I think it converted about 10 years ago. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. That I just mean because the way that the building is structured, it doesn't, it's not as if every unit looks the same. Um, there's different patios, different layouts, you know, and so it, it, so more creative than something that would have been built with the concept of we're building this many condos. Right. Right. We have a few in town. They're they're really hard to get loans on. And a lot of people just don't want to deal with it, even though the prices are a little bit lower. Mm -hmm. um, and then how you're connected with everybody in the complex is a little freaky for some people too. Totally, yeah. And why the loans are so difficult is a little beyond me. I understand that the you're sharing, you're sharing. So in a TIC, you have a percentage ownership of the entire building, where in a condo, you actually own the walls in of the part of the building that you bought. So it's sort of like this mutual ownership thing. And technically the TIC board could say, we don't want to accept so-and-so who wants to buy this unit. And so it could be more difficult to sell down the line. Um, but yeah, that was such a nightmare loan to get it on. I remember the lender's name was Nimish. And I'm pretty sure he it was one of his first deals because he couldn't have screwed this up further than he did. <laughs> oh my gosh, Nimish, I'll never forget. <laughs> I don't know what he did. I he, but we, you know, we had a 30 day close. My clients were looking at multi unit properties. They could have bought something for two million dollars based on what they what their income was, and they decided not to get themselves into something that big. And they got a loan for. I mean, their property was seven fifty. It was not expensive at all. They got a little uh, TIC unit, you know, so they, they were well qualified for this loan. And somehow it took three months for him to put it together. And it was like on the phone with his manager and the manager's manager every day. And it would be like, oh, we, they just couldn't move it forward. Just stuck at some level in the bank that it just couldn't go forward. And did this just close? Um, it closed about four months ago. Okay. So it was in the refi boom which everything was very difficult. Yes, yes, that's true. Yeah, because that really backlogged us in terms of appraisals. And then lately we've had the, well, the rates are going to go up and that kind of freaked everybody out. So that created this stampede as well. So, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, I, just because I'm a realtor and I like to rant about stuff, but uh, what really ticks me off every year is that the lenders give the, people that work for them holidays, but they give them ho the holidays. Like they'll, for instance, the first week of December, everybody's there, but the second week, Shirley gets to take a week off and Shirley works with Jerry. Uh -huh. Well, Shirley and Jerry both decide to take the week off and they let them. <laughs> then the next week it's, you know, so-and-so and so-and-so, and, -so, and then they're going to combine it with Christmas. So the next thing we know, we literally have three weeks out of a month where we have nobody, nobody, nobody to do anything. And they do it every year. And then this year they hid behind COVID. Well, there were- Everything oh, hid behind COVID. Everything hides behind COVID. And oh, there were, you know, and all this sort of stuff. And I've just, 
I that just really frustrated me that the the lenders were not paying attention to holidays. They were letting two people go on on holiday at the same time who actually supported each other. And then they would let another holiday, you know, because we have Thanksgiving and then we let another holiday slam into that. And I just thought a little bit of planning and this there would be, no be such a problem. Yeah. Well, banks don't care. And so I always tell buyers, <laughs> do not just go to the bank and give them an application. The person who takes the application gets their 600 bucks and then they just push it up into higher parts of the bank. You know, you got to go to a mortgage broker <laughs> oh, <rock laughs> one that I know that I get on the phone with that works with me. That's going to make the deal happen. <laughs> I want to talk to this person. Yeah. And then, you know, at least with a, a broker, you, you do have, they have somebody that they can actually talk to as well. And they don't have to, you know, some of these big, like online lenders, they have to call a call center and they have to get routed to a person who's working. They don't even know who they're getting. Right. Yeah. And then it's, it's, I mean, I know, you know, this, but just cause we're recording, <laughs> it's better to use a, mortgage broker because they can shop the loan around. So if Bank of America decides to change some small parameter on what they're lending on, how many units are owner occupied or whatever they're changing and they're, you know, what they're willing to do, that mortgage broker can go to a different bank and get that same loan somewhere else. <laughs> Double apping people. Yeah. Having people have another person in their pocket as well, which doesn't, it's not always really fair to the lenders. Um, but sometimes that other person can get it done where the for some reason that one person can't, there's that too. Yeah. Out. Yeah. I can't think of anything. I've, um, selling a house with a failed septic system. That's always fun. Oh my gosh. I forgot the story of my own place. I, so oh. I bought this, um, condo in San Francisco, but I owned a one bedroom in Oakland. And I, I sold it and it was scary times because I saw the moment in San Francisco where the market had dropped a bit to buy what I did buy, but then I had to sell my open place, refinance, roll that money in because I couldn't hold them both. And um, when I had my, it was a one bedroom by Lake Merritt in Oakland and one bedroom condos have really gone down in price, but I wanted so badly to get in here in San Francisco that I took that risk and I put mine on the market. Um, I, again, didn't follow my own advice. I decided to stage it myself because <laughs> I was like, well, gosh, I'm moving from, you know, I'm moving out of the place I live in now. And then I'm selling a one bedroom, moving into a two bedroom. I'll just buy myself nice stuff and I'll just stage it myself. Totally not. I would never tell, ever tell a seller to stage it yourself, ever. And there I am like stressing out, buying stuff I don't even want, like trying to make the play. I was like, what have I done? So we went on the market and, um, I, I was able to sell it. I got a little nervous because it, it didn't go on and off the market as quickly as I wanted to. So I was anxious about it, but we did get an offer. The really sweet woman um, and we, the loan went through, everything went through and we went and we were trying to plan the final walkthrough. And the agent, um, for whatever reason, I think the agent, uh, the, the agent representing the buyer had to get like a mouse surgery of some kind. So she postponed doing the final walkthrough until we had already closed. So the day that we recorded and the money transferred from uh, the buyer's account, you know, over, that's when I went there with the agent to hand her keys and did the final walkthrough. Of course, you know, it was already closed. And I show up on the property and I had been in and out of this place like crazy, never saw anything. There was a leak coming through the ceiling of the bathroom all over. We, it was just, from the fan, there was water leaking all over the ground, which is an HOA issue, right? Because it's in the, the plumbing system of the, but I, it was like, oh, and the agent and I looked at each other and it was like, technically her problem. Of course, I got on the phone right away with the HOA, like, hey, I need someone out here right now. This is a leak. And so I got, I got someone to go out there, but then it was like, okay, bye. And I just left her there and just like walked out. I was like, Oh my God, I can't believe that just happened. Imagine if we had done the final walkthrough right before it had closed, the whole deal would have fallen apart, you know? Well, there's a, I mean, that poor buyer, but I, I it did get handled, but it did take a week for them to handle it. And the poor buyer had to have her new house have a leak coming through the ceiling of the bathroom. So her agent could have really gotten in trouble for doing that walkthrough later. I mean, I don't know that the final walkthrough is actually um, required. It's not required. It's not required, but you can actually 
stop everything until you can hold everything back. Yeah, if it hadn't closed and there was a leak coming through the ceiling, I think it could have all gotten held back. And I was kind of just like, I felt really bad, but I was so happy to walk out of there. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, no. <sighs> um, but that's a really good lesson to, I, I, I worked with a realtor for uh, about a year kind of closely and she never owned a house. She never bought a house. She never owned a house. Mm -hmm. And I always kind of felt like it was like the principal who works in the school that doesn't have kids. You know, it, it just always seemed like you have to have that kind of pain of selling and buying and, and, and then dealing with what you buy. I bought a house that needed a lot of work. I had no idea how much work it needed till I got in it. I mean, I had an idea it needed a foundation, but it was just pretty much everything after that. Mm -hmm. And I think that pain really helps you grow as an agent or a, you know, yeah, really... it helps you be empathetic. Yeah. It's such a, it's such a hard thing to go through. I mean, you, your offer gets accepted and then you go, oh, is it worth it? Should I have done that? <laughs> it's like a human, human nature to do, to do that, <laughs> to second guess. Like, wait, I got it. Maybe is it, should I have it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. We actually, we were going to buy another house last year and the seller comments and some of the information on the preliminary title report, her boyfriend was on title and they said to us, well, you're going to have to get an attorney and get them off. <laughs> and I was like, huh? And then we talked to the city and the city said, oh, and by the way, once you buy the property, we're coming after you because this seller hasn't been doing everything they're supposed to. And we're like, huh? Uh. Like, oh, and you have to accept owner financing. And just without even asking my husband, I just called up the agent and said, we are out. I don't know what's going on here, but we are out. Yeah. Done. And I, in that moment thought, I, I, I had some really solid stuff to take to another buyer at some point in my career to say, you'll know when you're out is, and it, it comes to you. you. You'll know when it may not be the right thing for you. Unfortunately, in no contingent offers, you don't always have that opportunity, but maybe leading up to it or maybe in the offer, but knowing that, no, I'm out mm -hmm. right, is also really, it's important. Absolutely. It's the same as well, when you're in. Even in a non-contingent offer, if the prelim, if we hadn't seen the prelim yet, and then it came up that there was someone on title that, isn't selling the home. How could that be though? If he's on title, wouldn't he have to sign in order for ownership to transfer? Yes. So what, how could that be that it would be on the buyer? Yeah. Well, they wanted it to be on me. <laughs> I don't think uh, that's where the rub came in. Yeah. <laughs> like, Oh, by the way. And, um, you'll have to get him off. And it was like, uh, no, there's something. And then, and then, uh, whipped cream here on this Sunday, uh, the agent who sold the property sent me an email last week and said, hey, by the way, um, what did the city tell you? Can you send an email and detail everything that they they told you? Wow. And I said, I don't remember. Yeah. And so he's got some probably trouble coming from all that. And I mean, I would have been able to weather it. I just kind of kept feeling like there was something else going on and I couldn't quite put my finger on it. So yeah, something sketchy. Oh, it's interesting. But I, I think realtors who are actually involved in real estate at some point um, are, they are a better agent in my opinion. Yeah. And there's so much emotion that goes into the entire process that it helps to have gone through it yourself. <laughs> right. So be there for them, you know? Yeah. Because yeah, we, you never want someone to start down the path of buying something they're going to regret. So it's good to upfront be ready. Hey, are you sure this is what you want? You know? Right. Yeah. Now, when you were buying it for yourself, did you ever ask your partner, like, well, what do you think about, I mean, did you bounce stuff off her or did you just go in and do the whole thing yourself? No, I definitely bounced stuff off. As a matter of fact, we had it written, the offer written up in her name. Did you? Yeah. yeah. She's like, let me do the negotiating for you. And since she's been an agent for 34 years here, uh, every agent knows her, including the agent that was representing the sale of this. And she's like, let me present it to stay out of the presenting part. And I think that was very smart. 
Um, yeah. Because you're too tied up. And I actually, it was listed at 945 and I offered 860. And frankly expected a counter and didn't get one. And I was like, what? <laughs> then you're like, oh, what's wrong with it? <laughs> I, yeah, no, actually, surprisingly, th this property I've always felt really great about. I'm happy to say that every time I did never have that uh, buyer's remorse thing happen. I had a buyer's like, oh shit, when I realized I had to sell my Oakland property and roll it in and I didn't know if I was going to be able to do it and I, like for selling the other one. But no, this one I've always felt really good about. And I send buyers home. We always, we look, we look at properties. They love it. They want to write offers and, you know, and everything. And I'm like, nope, you got to sleep on it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't care how hot the market is because them backing out creates so much ill will. And I had buyers that backed out from an, an offer. And now this guy's listing so many properties and I'm like, uh, it just kind of cut us completely out of what I can show for them. I'm they're They're okay. They're fine. They're fine and stuff, but it, it just go it home. Let's so think about this. Yeah. yeah. It's so stressful for everyone involved. Nobody wants it to fall out of contract. It's just that's why you're representing the seller. You want everything to be really, really clear, including the boyfriend on title thing up front, you know, <laughs> and then on the buying side, same thing. I don't, I don't let my buyers buy into the hype. I say, if it's a competitive property, I say, you have to think of your highest and best and go as high as you can. But if we lose it, it's not a big deal because I don't want ever anyone to be in over their head or feel like, oh my gosh, we offered too much. I can't believe we offered that much or have second thoughts. So the, the bidding war hype that some people try to build, I'm like, no, 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 no. Let that go. <laughs> yeah. You want to, you want to spend the money you can spend and feel like you're getting the right property or lose a few uh, to begin with. Sometimes people need to lose their offer a few times to get it. Yeah. Yeah. They, and then I find that buyers who kind of get in the, the houses that really get a lot of attention start to notice the houses on the periphery that might really work for them and they're not as competitive and maybe they need a little bit of work, but then they, the lure of not working so hard to get a property and just settling down and it, it, those homes start to look a little bit more attractive. Exactly. Or like what I was mentioning, the case in San Francisco that happens a lot is someone will list something at a, a more reasonable price what it's actually going to go for. But then there's this other gorgeous property that's, that is better than that one, but is listed at the same price, but it's going to go way over. Yes. So that one, there's all this hype and all this, and everyone, no one's looking at this other one. So I'll bring them back around. But remember this one, <laughs> this is actually in your price point. You know, this one, don't forget. And don't forget if they didn't stage the place, you know, or some, something that, sometimes people want this image right when they walk in wow but when you really spend some time in the property a, a really nice property maybe just wasn't staged well or something like that oh poor marketing is my favorite uh -huh. I've sold so many houses of just come look at this house and it's, well it's got pink wallpaper and the photos are bad I'm like that's yeah. it that's weird that's, to go there it's exactly that's what? That's exactly what happened with the one bedroom condo that I bought in Oakland. Um, what the, there had been a death on the property, which of course was like right there. The seller died on the property and the, the, the heirs were from somewhere else. So they listed it what they wanted. They were from a different state. So they listed it at what they wanted to get. They didn't underlist it. They didn't paint. They didn't do the carpets new. And I walked inside and there was still a loofah sponge in the shower. Nice. <laughs> oh my god so it's like seller died on property and there's a sponge in the shower like oh my god clean the sponge up at least you know there's a... so I saw that sit on the market and I thought okay I can fix this place up and it will be worth a lot more and did you do well on it I uh not com not crazy well but considering that I sold it in COVID and had bought it only three years prior I still I sold it for more than I bought it for so that's good that's yeah. good well, anything else you want to add? Um, I don't know. I guess not. <laughs> I've uh, never done a podcast before. Thanks for having me. Oh, yeah. yeah I'm just kind of jumping in head first. I had a home inspector a couple weeks ago with Stager. Um, I'm actually going to do 
one on uh, a local business because I also want to highlight some local businesses. Um, a, a mushroom store. Oh, cool. <laughs> I know some kind of um, random stuff, but um, do they forage their own? They do. Yeah, that's very Santa Cruz. I love it. They have a store in San Francisco. Um, <laughs> I don't remember the name of the store, unfortunately. Well, I'll have them on. Um, but uh, yeah, this is a really fun meeting. And the whole idea is really to get some good conversations. In. And I, I really think that um, even people buying here could learn a lot from listening to you, though, about San Francisco, because you, you guys are always kind of ahead of us in terms of negotiation and where the market's going. I really hope we don't go to the style of $9.99 and see where it goes. That would be hard. Although we've had a few that actually look like that in terms of sales. But we've always kind of looked to you, you guys, because your your market's always a little ahead of us too. So we kind of can see where the market's going, mm -hmm. and then we have a lot of the same professionals interchangeably uh, going from those companies and and having little satellite places. Because Google has some satellite stuff here in San uh, Santa Cruz. Yeah. So that that I think people will learn from having you on. So that was really exciting. Yeah. Awesome. So you're going to be, um, are you going to be able to be, um, boy, this is a lot of ums. You will be in uh, clubs here soon, maybe? Uh, potentially, yeah. I mean, they're talking about 25% um, capacity, which in a comedy club, gosh, I can't wait for the days when you can just be packed in because laughter is contagious, you know? So you want to feel that laughter all around you, but yeah, I think we're going to be able to go indoors in the next couple of weeks. Um, surprisingly, the outdoor shows have been pretty fun because people are so excited to be out doing something. So I yeah. still have that for now. I'm glad it's back. I kind of at the beginning of the pandemic was thinking there's all these working professional comedians that are further along than me, you know, actually working professional comedians that have no stage time right now. So when anything opens up, they're going to be the first to be booked. But somehow there's still an audience for the local scene. Well, I will challenge you to, to uh, work some real estate comedy in there and I'll find you in the summer and have you on again. And <laughs> Okay, sounds good. All some good stories. Thank you so much. Uh, tell people where they can find you. Um, yeah, so my name is Allison Hooker, <laughs> like the profession. And uh, I'm Hilarious Hooker on Instagram. It's sort of more of a comedy feed than a real estate one, but I try to put a little bit of real estate in there. Um, I'm part of the SF Reload team. SFreload.com is Heidi and I. And yeah, if you Google me, you'll find me. <laughs> awesome. Well, I am really glad to have met you as well. And um, I will catch you if we're too busy in the summer, I'll catch you in the fall. All right. Sounds good. Thank you. All right. Have a great day. Goodbye. Yeah, bye. Bye. Hey, thank you for listening. If you want to talk more, find me on livethesantacruzlife.com, on YouTube, on Twitter, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, or give me a call. My number's in the show.